Hi, um, so you can see I've had another chance to do a bit more playing around with these iPod um, nano screens. This is hooked up to a little um, camera module. This sort of really came out of a couple of things. One is I um, found these camera modules. This is uh, based on the um, OV9655, which is a uh, 1280 by 1024 camera. These you can get in, in small, sort of small to medium quantities for about £1.50 from China. And the nice thing is these have actually got quite a lot, a lot of onboard processing. They do the debayering. They'll give you an RGB 565 data stream in the same format that this display likes. And they've got a few sort of other options like scaling and edge enhancement and a few other sort of quite fun little things. But the nice thing is that because this display's got its own memory on board, you can actually get, these do, um, in VGA mode, they do 30 frames a second. And because this has got this LCD's got its own memory, it doesn't have to run exactly the same frame rate as the camera does. So um, you can take 30 FPS data from this, write it to the display, and it will just update at the um, camera's update rate. There's a few other variants. There's um, just the bare modules themselves. There's also um, a company called Waveshare that sells these sort of breakout boards. This is actually for, um, a slightly different version of the module. There's actually, for the 9655, there's actually two versions of the module out there. One is quite similar to the um, Omnivision evaluation module, and this one, uh, which has got a Sunny brand name, and the pinouts of these are completely different, even the, um, the flex contacts are on opposite side, so these are sort of totally different pinouts for basically the same chip, which is something that needs to be, need to keep an eye out for. Um, so they're available with these breakout boards. Um, there's also, this is a, another chip, this is a VGA chip, which is an OV7670. And again, these are quite commonly available. There's quite a lot of breakout boards out there with M12 lens holders, but there's also the, these little modules um, here. These are, aren't quite as cheap as these. These are still only about four quid or something. Um, and these, I think these will actually do 60 FPS at VGA. I've not looked too closely about the details. Um, on that and so they've got these little lenses that the, these ones are actually adjustable there's a little bit of sealant on there but you can actually um, adjust it. The other thing this came out of was um, to process like this I've um, just used this is one of the first boards, FPGA boards I made to drive these things so I'm just just hanging the camera off the spare pins off here just so I could get the thing up and running but one of the reasons for looking at this was that um, Though one of my complaints about FPGAs in general is they tend to come in high pin count. There's, there's very few out there below 100 pins. The Lattice X02, they actually do a version in a QFN32. So I was looking at, you know, potentially a very, very cheap solution for getting from a camera to a display. Um, I'm not really sure what for or what I might use it for. That's just a sort of side issue. It's more the challenge of doing this. This FPGA so it's got onboard configuration memory, onboard core, onboard core voltage regulation, and an onboard oscillator. So pretty much the only things that you need to do this are this FPGA and a few voltage regulators. Now on the face of it, it looks like you might end up using a ridiculous number of different voltages. If you actually look at all the voltages in this system, you've got 1.2 for the FPGA core, 1.8 logic for the um, LCD and the camera, 2.5 volts analog supply for the camera, 3 volts analog supply for the LCD, and a 12 volts supply for the backlight. But fortunately, um, the FPGA has got an onboard core voltage regulator, so that takes care of the 1.2. Um, this camera is not totally clear from the data sheet, but if you read it carefully, it has actually got an inbuilt 1.8 volt regulator. So if your logic supply is over about 2.5 volts, you don't actually need the 1.8 volt supply, but unfortunately, I can't pull enough current out of it to drive the display as well, so I need a 1.8 volt regulator in there. The other two rails, the uh, the two and a half volt from the camera, um, can actually run up to about three volts, and the three volt rail for the display is actually quite happy down to 2.5. And it happens that 2.8 volts is, as well as being halfway between the two, it's actually one of the cheaper voltage regulators. If you look at cheap low dropout voltage regulators, there seems to be a few very popular voltages in terms of what's available really cheap. So 1.8 and 2.8 are the most common. So um, we've basically reduce this down to uh, 1.8 volt and a 2.8 volt regulator for everything. Um, the FPGA, it's happy we're running at 2.8 to regulate its, its um, core voltage, so all the logic is running at 1.8. Um, the only other thing is the backlight inverter, which is just a simple step-up inverter chip. I was sort of thinking of, well, can I do a little boost converter with, an F with the FPGA using PWM, but I thought I just, I just can't be bothered. It just it was too much hassle. These these backlight booster chips are, are so cheap. One thing these things do need is they've got quite a lot of registers that are accessed over I2C, and you know, they call it SCCB, but it's really I2C. It's like Atmel with their TWI. It's just to avoid the Philips trademark on I2C. 
what, one thing about this camera compared to a few others is it's got a lot of registers that you have to um, write to non-default values. The to there's a total of about 200 registers in the thing and the default register settings seem to be quite a long way away from what you need. Um, it was actually a struggle trying to find a set of complete set of register settings because although I had a data sheet, it was a preliminary one, there were some undocumented things and there were one or two things that were just plain wrong. But I found a, some register sets in um, some SGS Thompson demo um, demos which were probably written by someone that had access to the full um, current data sheet for this chip so um, I managed to get all the register settings but because there's quite a lot of registers to initialize I did actually have a bash at getting all the register initialization into the um, the small FPGA but unfortunately there just wasn't enough memory I think you know if you spend some time really squeezing everything down figuring out exactly which registers need to initialize you might just do it but it'll really be a struggle um, so I thought it was actually probably more practical I've just got this little pick pick behind here um, which um, for the minimum functionality you could just use one of the little six pin um, pick 10 devices to just throw the I2C data at the camera and then do, do nothing else but also some of the functions you've got on the camera like um, you can do some scaling and zooming and flipping and stuff that's the sort of thing you're going to want to do via writing I2C registers so adding a little pick in there um, especially as I don't really know quite what I want to do with this it just seemed like a, the, the sense of way to do it because it's much easier to do, do that sort of stuff um, from a processor than from a, an FPGA one thing that's a little bit annoying about these, um, although it's only got 32 pins, um, the usage of the pins is probably not quite as good as it could be. For example, there's actually separate power supply pins for each of four I.O. banks. It seems a little bit unlikely you're going to want to have four different I.O. supply, you know, voltage supplies on something this small. Uh, and that's probably just a function of how the um, the, die, the die is arranged and how it's bonded out. But it's a little bit annoying that you lose, you end up with, I think, 21 usable I.O. pins. One thing I have done, um, normally for FPGAs you use JTAG to program them. Um, this does have a, a way of programming it through I2C, but the other thing they've done is you can actually set a bit in the configuration data to make the JTAG pins dual function. You basically reduce it down to a single dedicated pin, which is JTAG enable. And depending on that state, that on the state of that pin, the other four pins are either JTAG pins or, fun or uh, other functions. And um, the the camera module has got a power down input which when you did set that power down input it tries states the data output so what I've done is I've just combined four of the camera data lines with the JTAG and I've connected the JTAG enable on this to the um, camera's power down so that if you just take that line high it powers the camera down and lets you do the JTAG programming and then um, returns those functions back to camera functionality so I, you know, I only use one pin for the programmability which to some extent recovers sort of some, some of the things that I've lost from the um, those extra uh, bank power supply pins the other thing uh, I want to look at is um, to reduce the number of pins I needed to drive the display. Um, on the uh, previous version um, you had sort of differential drive for clock and data and two bias pins to generate the MIPI um, line so I wanted to do a bit of experimentation to um, try and reduce that. Right, if you call what we had on the, this um, MIPI interface we've got two differential receivers for um, clock and data the signaling it starts off at the 1.8 volts level, drops down to a low level, and then you have the LVDS data on it. And there's the, the positive and negative side have a slightly different time, and it's this delay that actually puts the thing into its uh, high speed mode. Because these are differential inputs, in principle, yeah, the output is dependent on the difference between the inputs. So the way they're sort of normally driven is via um, a pair of differential signals, which are the inverse of each other. But what you can do um, is actually put a DC level for one of them, so it's still looking, it's just seeing a slightly smaller differential. Now this is probably going to have much worse noise and high-speed performance, but it, it, for what we're doing, it, it seems to work okay. So the actual drive circuitry gets simplified to um, our two output buffers, which are driving 1.8 volts from the FPGA for clock and data. Oh, incidentally, the other thing I found is that this transition between the low and high speed is completely independent for each channel so um, you can actually do that simultaneously on clock and data um, so you can actually use um, the same bias levels. What we have is our data drivers, we have our bias drivers, we have one for the plus and one for the negative side. So the uh, data and clock. Um, so you have the resistors generating these high levels that is uh, 47 ohms and these are 220. So these these form our so CP and DP, so the data data positive and uh, clock positive. If we go into our inputs, I've got this wrong way around. Data and clock. Um, 
and then for the negative side instead of driving those we can actually just put a pull up resistor against plus uh, 1.8 volts on both of these and then drive these with a second bias line from a um, basic one resistor from each bias line so th this bias line generates these big swings and then these, these resistors hold, hold it um, static. One minor complication is the inputs of these, when you put it into low speed mode it actually switches in a termination resistor so what you get instead of this, what you actually get is this because this resistor, although you're supposedly you know, hold it, trying to hold this at a fairly fixed um, voltage level, to, which is basically you're trying to get the middle of the LVDS level. Um, this resistor effectively, your clock, your, your signal comes from the other side and this resistor here wiggles this up and down a little bit, which doesn't actually seem to stop it working, but one thing you can do to actually give you more margin is you can actually put a capacitor across these resistors here, because the frequency of the, this clock entry sequence is much much lower than the frequency, you know, this is like of the order of a few microseconds, whereas this is like tens of megahertz. So this, these caps will have negligible effect on this. But what they will do is um, stabilise the voltage on this, which will give you a little bit, little bit more margin. So basically what that's done is we're now using just four, four output pins from the FPGA. That's implemented and working on, on this board quite happily and I've not actually put the capacitors on, so the capacitors just make the signals look a little bit like they've got a little bit more swing on. Maybe if you had um, slightly more length of the display these things would matter a bit more because it's, 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 it's um, very close, it, that, that seems to work um, quite happily. Those pull-ups were I think 470 and these, all these bias resistors are 47. I'll, I'll do a neat drawing and that stick it on my website at some point. And I've now done a PCB, now I've got all that tested, I know what, what needs to go to what. I've um, done a PCB for this, which I've just sent off. This actually fits within, th this outline here is actually the same size as, as the display itself. So we've just got the FPGA there, display, um, display connector there, couple of resistor packs. I haven't actually done that um, trick to avoid using the, using the differential drive because I want to keep it flexible. I, I've left the differential drive, so I'm using six pins on there. Um, there's a, a pick, again because I don't quite know what I'm going to use this for, I've put a bigger pick on there just so I've got a few options. And then we've just got the display connector, sorry the camera connector there. I've actually popular, done this for the both, the Wavelink and the, sorry, the Wave Share and the Sunny camera versions. Um, and then we've just got the backlight inverter and two audio regulators for the supply and that, that's, that's it basically, that's all there is. So um, hopefully I might find some interesting and fun things to do with this, but uh, so I'm going to make a few of these boards up just so I've got something to play with more easily to sort of wave around. It's a bit hard to wave that camera around on its little breakout board and um, see if something interesting comes out of it.